The Leviathan Chronicles. Season 3. Epilogue. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening from the flight deck. We've just received some reports that we'll be passing through a small patch of turbulence ahead, so we'll be turning on the fastened seatbelt sign. So if you're up and about the cabin, we ask that you please return to your seat and fasten your seatbelts. Oh, I wonder if I could just quickly run to the loo. If I got up right now, I don't think the flight attendants will notice. Whit Roberts glibly grunted at his seatmate as she stepped into the aisle of the business class cabin on Air China Flight 4396 from Newark to Shenzhen. The 747 passed over the remote foothills of the Gobi Desert, and the lightless surface below stretched endlessly, making it appear that the plane was flying over water. What no one realized is that the flight was already over a thousand miles off course. Huh? That's weird. I'm in flight. I thought I shut it off earlier. Wit reached into his backpack on the floor. He had just received a text. Open your carry-on bag, combination 4672. What the hell? I'm over Chinese airspace. How could I? Open your carry-on bag, wit. You have less than 60 seconds. Who is this? 60 seconds before what? Before the plane is ripped apart. Holy shit. Wit fumbled to unfasten his seatbelt. Sir. He sprang up from his seat have to take your and seat. ripped open the overhead storage compartment, slamming the carbon fiber bag onto the cabin floor. Sir, I'm sorry, but the captain has turned on the fastened seatbelt sign. Two, three, Sir! Lady, please. Wit threw open the suitcase, revealing a dark face mask. What the hell is this? Sir! Put on the mask and strap Sir, yourself into seat. You Five to seconds? My instructions and... <laughs> Two massive explosions detonated on the left wing, sending the plane careening to its port side. Passengers screamed as the plane fell into a violent dive. A food cart broke loose of its footbrake and slammed into the flight attendant, knocking her to the ground. Oxygen masks erupted out of the overhead compartments of the cabin as gravity within the plane dissipated. Three passengers were brutally smashed upwards, leaving red blood marks on the ceiling. Wit desperately clung onto the armrest of his seat as his legs began to rise higher than his head. Seat. Got to get to the seat. Mayday, mayday. We have lost all engines. Repeat, we have lost all the engines. Wit felt his phone vibrate again. His hand was shaking so hard he could barely see the words. Put on the mask. Stay fastened to your seat. Just as he managed to buckle his seatbelt, both emergency doors burst open in front of Wit. Two of the flight attendants were sucked out violently. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see other passengers that were buckled into their seats lose consciousness as the plane fell out of the sky. The damn mask. The 747 thrashed from side to side. Bodies were now being thrown around the cabin like bloody dolls. Keeping his head close to his lap, Wick took the mask and pulled it over his head. It created an airtight seal over his face and allowed him to fully open his eyes despite the depressurization of the cabin. Without warning, electrical sparks erupted out of the side of the plane beside Wit. He could feel the outside jet stream rushing around him, and his body began to shiver uncontrollably from the frigid cold. The sparks continued downward until a 30-foot piece of fuselage suddenly ripped away from the plane. More bodies and debris flew past Wit when he then saw something he had never seen before in his life. A spheroid pod was affixed to the outside of the aircraft, anchored by two articulated mechanical arms that gripped what remained of the deteriorating fuselage. Jesus. The strange pod also possessed a spinning buzzsaw and a strong claw-like appendage. Oh my God! Wit felt faint and cold as the buzzsaw shot directly towards his neck. But to his relief, the mechanical arm moved lower, striking the mountain clamps of his seat bracket, quickly cutting through the metal. The arm shot forward again, showering wit in more painful sparks. 
The claw of the whip's entire seat row into the pod and quickly disengaged from the Air China flight into free fall. Just before a parachute was deployed, Witt peered out from a clear panel on the side as he watched his Air China flight bank heavily to the left before disappearing completely from view. The escape pod descended through a thick bank of low-lying clouds until the placid blue water of Lake Karnas was visible below. Witt felt the pod touch ground as the explosive bolts fired, causing the front panel to break away, allowing a burst of fresh Mongolian air to rush inwards. Witt squinted his eyes and stepped out of the pod into a small pebble shoreline. He saw the woman with the white coat standing with her back to him, staring out at the lake. Next to her towered a 15-foot mechanical humanoid with two titanium arms on both its left and right side. Neither turned to look at him. You're late. Dublin, Ireland. Point of Guinness, please. Oberlin St. Clair entered a crowded pub off Dawson Street and for a split second allowed the familiar sounds and scenes of his native country to wash over him. He unfolded a small note in his pocket that McAllen had passed him 48 hours ago. Meet at the Speckled Hen in Dublin at 4 p.m. tomorrow. Trust me. There you go, point of... Well... As I live and breathe, Oberlin St. Clair. How are you, my old friend? It's been more than a spell, I reckon. Kieran, my God, it's great to see you. How long has it been, mate? Oh, I'd say at least eight, no, maybe nine years now. You're looking trim, keeping yourself in shape, I see. Yeah, I'm trying my best. Are you and Caroline still together? We are, we are. We just had the latest wee one born earlier this year. Is that your second? Third. My God. I've been away too long. That you have? Are you still in Alaska? Tell us what you've been doing with yourself. Oh, the usual. Got kidnapped by a psychopathic rogue CIA agent. Taken on his blimp that crashed in China, where I boarded a train to Tibet and climbed a mountain before being rescued and flown to Japan. Oh, but then the Yakuza gangsters kept me as ransom until my partner double-crossed them and took me to an underwater city before flying to the Arctic to defeat evil extraterrestrials. Till I start building you a second pint, Oberlin. Sounds like you could use it, mate. Ha! The old coot! You always knew how to spin a good yarn! Ha! Oh! I gotta go check on some of the food orders. Get up with you in a bit! Underwater city. Yeah. Quite a yarn spinner I am. You forgot the part where you were seduced by a mysterious woman who gave you the night of your life and then flew halfway across the earth to see you. Oh my god. My Lee? What? What are you doing here? I... I... You... Breathe, Oberlin. Oh, just come here. Ah. <laughs> you look amazing. You're a sight for sore eyes yourself. I've been looking everywhere for you. I, I, I have so many questions. What are you doing here? What happened when you got to Leviathan? How did you know that I, I... I just can't believe you're standing here in front of me. Miss, can I get you a pint of Guinness as well? Actually, I'll take a cognac. Remy XO. A bit early for a cognac, don't you think, miss? From where I'm standing, it feels late. <laughs> Be careful. I've seen Kieran here give blokes a kneecap and for less. Kiss me again, Overland. Oh, you don't have to ask me twice. <sighs> Overland. The last time I saw you, you jumped through that portal at Mount Sheng Lung in Tibet before it exploded. I thought you might be dead. My Lee closed her eyes for a moment before speaking and then took a long sip of her cognac, nearly finishing it. <sighs> Not quite yet. What happened to you? Did you manage to find your father? How about a drink first? I think you just had one, my love. Then it's the perfect time for another. My, please tell me what happened to you. Where's your father now? Dead. Oh my god. Jesus, I'm so sorry. He was alive when we reached the portal, wasn't he? He- It's a long story. Well, it's a good thing we've got some time. Where are you staying? I, I don't mean to be presumptuous. Oh, I can't stay. What? You just got here. I'm sorry, but I don't have any choice. Why the hell can't you stay? You just said you flew across the world to see me. Well, here I am. I'm on a mission. What? To drink the pub out of all of its cognac? I have a target. Who or what is your target? As I said, it's a long story. After I jumped to Leviathan, I was confined to quarters until they could figure out what to do with me. 
When Leviathan started to collapse, I thought that was the end for me. Everything started shaking, the walls, the floors. When the water started to rush in, it destroyed more than half of the cathedral that overlooked the city. I was able to escape from the building and blend into the crowds that were racing for the lifeboats. It started out being orderly, but when the fire started, it became a panic, and they pushed as many of us into Zephyrs as possible. I had no idea where we were heading, but on board I heard people talking about the rendezvous point, some place called the Forbidden Island. Twelve hours later, we landed on Niihau in Hawaii, and everyone was rushed into these underground bunkers. After they scanned me, we were separated, and I was taken to a room with just a chair and a bed, where I waited for a long, long time, until someone came in. You know, you're lucky to be alive. I know. Actually, I'm the one that should feel really lucky to be alive. Especially given the fact that you tried to kill me and my entire strike force. You knew Iron Gate was a trap. Why? Why kill us, Agent Lee? It wasn't my door. The booby trap was set by Wit Roberts. He knew if you infiltrated the database in Iron Gate that you could get full access to all Black Door activity and use it to find him and Jason Sterling. I gave you the right access code. Wit must have linked the passcode to the self-destruct sequence. I think you're lying. Then interrogate Wit Roberts instead. I intend to, but we need to find him first. Air China, flight 4396 disappeared from radar 72 hours ago. The flight took off from Newark headed to Shenzhen, China. What happened? It never arrived. Our last intel had the plane more than a thousand miles off course before we lost the transponder signal. Thermal scans show a brief but intense heat signature in the Altai Mountains. 747s don't just disappear, Agent Lee. And the Chinese government won't let anyone near the suspected crash site. They have all the search teams and press focused on an area west of Beijing, hundreds of miles away. Sounds like a mystery. Quite. I also lost contact with a very important operative, one of my best. I believe she was on the same flight as Wit. So you've lost a plane, an operative, and a bad guy. That's a lot of losing, McAllen Orsel. You're going to help me find them. All of them. And why would I do anything to help you? Because you were trying to find Wit Roberts also. You know the threat he represents, both to Black Door and the world. Hard to feel threatened by anything when you're six miles under the ocean. You're not under the ocean anymore. Neither am I. And if the thought of Wit Roberts stealing a plane with hundreds of people on board and then vanishing off the face of the Earth doesn't scare you, then maybe I know something that will. Oh? What door did you say you were? Door number three. And what was door number three's specialty? <sighs> Sino-American affairs. Right. So, you would know how to get in. Even to the remote areas, right? Hard areas to access within China? Maybe. Yeah. Well, maybe Wit Roberts is alive. And maybe my operative survived the crash. And maybe you're going to help me find them both. Because maybe your body never leaves this island unless you help me. Maybe you just disappear. Do you understand? My Lee stared at McCallum for a long time before speaking. Let's say I help you find Whit Roberts. What's to stop me from running as soon as I get off this island? Because I think there's someone that you might want to see first. Whit Roberts is alive? We don't know. That's what I need to find out. He's alive? If the intel is right, we're talking about a 747 dropping out of the sky in a remote mountainous region in China. The odds are quite low. He's alive. Like a fucking cockroach. That deranged psycho could survive anything. That's what I need to find out. That's, that's why I need to go. McKellen is right. He is incredibly dangerous. I want to go with you. Are you out of your mind? No. He's a trained Black Door operative. Look at your hand. Look at the Idrisil. I've beaten that son of a bitch before. I'm not scared of what he could do to me. I'm going with you. Besides... I think you need me. I don't need anyone. You know, I don't know what to do with you. It's like, you want someone to come in, but you won't ever unlock the door. I'm coming to you earnestly, my Lee. Honestly. Why did you even come looking for me at all? She told me where you'd be. Oh. Now I get it. This was McAllen's idea. You didn't want to come. Not true. She told me she cares for you very much, you know. Me? Less so. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hey. Hey, don't go. I'm sorry. My my humor tends to run a bit dark. Don't go. Please. 
book, I, I had to watch my father die in front of me in Leviathan, his blood literally on my face after not seeing him for decades. Sometimes my darker instincts take control. Call it a self-defense mechanism. Feels more like self-sabotage. The world is starting to feel out of control. I need to go to work to put things back in order. That's what I do, Oberlin, despite myself. Well, sounds like you've got it all figured out. I'm glad you're okay, Mai. Truly, I am. Good luck in China. But if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go find another pub that doesn't serve cognac. Please don't leave. Don't. Don't go. Why should I stay? You clearly don't need me. You said so yourself. Maybe you really don't need anyone. But I want you, and I want to need you. Is that why you came to Dublin? I was in a jail cell in Leviathan. A beautifully appointed one, but a jail cell nonetheless. And I was starting to get worried it might turn into my coffin. And while my first thought was how to escape, my second thought was about you. I didn't know if you were alive or dead in Tibet, and I wanted to see your face again before I died. McCallan told me you were looking for me, looking hard in Leviathan. Not a lot of people worry about me, and I wanted to th thank you in person. Thank you, Oberlin, for being far kinder to me than I deserve. My Lee raised her slender arm and stroked Oberlin's face before allowing her hand to drop into his. She squeezed his fingers tightly before leaning into a concupiscent kiss. She closed her eyes and let her lips linger before reaching for the glass of cognac again. But before she could raise the glass to her lips, Oberlin gently pushed her arm back down. I'm sorry for the way I am. The person you are is the one I'm falling for, my. Thank you for staying in the fight, Oberlin. Most people wouldn't. I'm not most people. That's why I'm in Dublin. So... Does that mean you're going to let me go with you? Let me think about it. You said you didn't have much time. Well, I do have a little bit of time. What hotel did you say you were staying at? Oberlin, St. Clair? Vlissingen, the Netherlands. McAllen sat in the back seat of the Mercedes Maybox 62, holding a strange note she had received two weeks earlier. Meet me at the Vanguard shipyard in Holland in two weeks. Slip 218. I promise it will be worth it. There was no name and no signature contained in the note. We're here, ma'am. Um, excuse me. Excuse me, can you direct me to slip 218? Of course. At the end of the pier on the right. It's the biggest one in the shipyard. Wait, seriously? That's slip 218? But the dock worker had already walked away, leaving McAllen standing on the concrete pier of one of Europe's largest shipyards. Deckhands, marine construction workers, and tool-belted engineers walked past her, but yet her gaze remained fixed. At the end of the dock, was berthed a gargantuan yacht stretching well over 200 feet. The design of the ship was curved and sensual with deep-cut organic lines. Several radar domes were situated upon the top of the fifth deck McAllen counted, and at least four arrays of loading davits were installed in the aft. As McAllen walked closer, she could see a heavy construction crane swiveling to deposit what looked like a four-man submarine into a large cargo hold in the belly of the massive ship. A winsome woman wearing a crisp uniform stood at the end of the gangway, holding an iPad. McCannon Orson, I presume? I am. Wonderful. I'm Nestle Case, Head of Logistics. Welcome aboard. The captain has been expecting you. Has he? Yes. If you'll please follow me. McCallum walked up the ship's gangway, watching as Leslie reached to her tattooed arm to her earpiece, to quietly making stuff. arrangements. This way, please. Once aboard, she could see that a good deal of construction still remained on the vessel. Sorry about the mess. We're trying to get her seaworthy by the end of summer. Performance tests begin in a few weeks. Oh, we're just down these stairs. McAllen entered the main cabin and was led down a flight of carpeted steps to arrive at a short hallway, which was awash in gleaming teak. Leslie opened the door, revealing a rich mahogany-paneled library, with one wall filled entirely with books of maritime history, while the other featured custom slots for at least a hundred nautical maps. A robust wet bar with gleaming glassware was situated in the far corner. May I fix you a cocktail? Uh... Well, certainly. 
Still lay on the rocks to twist. Of course. The captain will join us shortly. Sorry, I know you're a Venusius girl, but that hooch is hard to come by these days. McAllen looked up from her drink to see a tall, close-shaven man wearing off-white pants and a trim navy blue shirt, featuring the same logo as the ship. He looked tan and fit and was sporting a long, warm smile. Tully! McAllen, it's so great to see you. Leslie, you can leave us alone for a little bit. Of course, Captain. I'll be on com if you need me. Tully flashed McAllen a sly grin and fixed himself a glass of Casa Azul Añejo tequila from the bar. Um, so Tully? <laughs> what the hell is this? This is the Invenios. This is the dream ship Oberlin and I always wanted to build. The greatest treasure hunting vessel ever built. Bob Ballard would give his eye teeth for a boat like this. Dual sub bays, aerial and ROV drones, two high-speed tenders, built-in hyperbaric chambers, full radar, LIDAR, and side-scan sonar arrays, multi-beam mapping system, and a 10,000-mile range. And I think it also came with a fully stocked bar, but I'd have to check. Oh my god, Tully, this is your dream job on your dream boat. Wait, who owns the boat? Who are you working for? McAllen. This is my boat. I own it. Well, technically, Oberlin and I own it together, but yeah, this is my new home. My dream. And it's all thanks to you. Me? What are you talking about? I gave you five million dollars. This is a yacht. A mega yacht. It is the biggest ship in the marina. This must have cost tens of millions of dollars. Um, more like hundreds. Holly, how is that possible? Well, remember back in New York? You were nice enough to put me up at the Crosby Hotel? Sure. Right. So, right after I saw you, I headed back to the hotel. And there was this package on my bed. I opened it up. And inside is a map. Super old one. It was hard to even tell what part of the world I was looking at. But then, I figured out that it was showing a shoreline that I recognized near the Sea of Cortez. And then I look at the date. 1638. What happened in 1638? A Spanish galleon called the Orlando Cortez went down in rough seas, reportedly carrying over 70 tons of silver coins and jewels. All reports had it in the mid to north Pacific, but they were all wrong. Turns out the ship was way further south and closer to Mexico than anyone realized. The map showed the route that the Cortez took from South America. A freaking treasure map? You're shitting me. Who gave it to you? That's the thing. I don't know. I can't figure it out. It was just lying on my hotel bed. There was no name, no nothing. So what did you do? Luckily, I didn't spend the $5 million you gave me in the 11 blocks it took me to walk back to the hotel. Instead, I wrapped up the map and headed back to Alaska. After a week, I was finally able to get a hold of Oberlin, and we started poring over it and cross-referencing other historical charts of that area of the Pacific. And so, what did you find? A reef. A hidden reef that wasn't highlighted on any later maps. So after two weeks back in Homer, we headed to Washington, where Oberlin knows another fellow Irishman that works at the Smithsonian. We get access to all of these old nautical journals that talk about a giant storm that devastated the Baja Peninsula right around the end of the 17th century. There was a massive reef about 40 miles offshore that no one had ever documented. It must have only been there until the hurricane destroyed it. The point is, Oberlin and I used the five million you gave me to charter a research vessel for a custom expedition. And we found it! McAllen, the Orlando Cortez. The clue was in the name all along. After decades, we finally found it! One of the biggest scores of all time. It, it was incredible! And it, it allowed us to build this. The Invenios. The greatest treasure hunting vessel that the world has ever seen. We'll be able to do incredible things with it, McAllen. Let me remind you that you've already done some incredible things, Tully. But this... Whew. This is another level. Thank you. Thank you, McAllen. I really wanted you to see it. I wasn't sure if the note would bring you, but I really wanted you to see what we built. <laughs> well, you played me well. You know I love a mystery. Maybe you should be a treasure hunter. I've got about 15 spare cabins if you want a spot on the crew. <laughs> that actually sounds like a ton of fun, Tully, but I have a full plate right now trying to establish a base of operations for the surviving immortals. A new headquarters. I bet that's the luckiest real estate agent in New York City. Not exactly. No, I'm sorry, that was a bad joke. I just meant with Leviathan dead. Leviathan's not dead. No, no, I didn't mean that. Certainly not the spirit of it. And, and you said thousands of immortals made it No, to... Tully, there's something else. What? Evangeline didn't launch Hayon from Leviathan. Her ship, the one she sacrificed to collide with the arrow, it didn't come from Leviathan. That's why no one ever saw it. That's how she was able to keep the project secret for so long. She developed a separate launch facility in the Cayman Trench south of Cuba. 
another underwater outpost, Tully. It's where she built a multi-generational starship without the general population knowing. A secret base within a secret base. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's only a launch station, but... But still. Holy shit, Mikhail. I know, Tully. A little piece of Leviathan still exists underwater. It gives us hope. We could all use a little hope these days. Did you see that China and North Korea are going to resume nuclear testing? Where's Evangeline when we need her? I know, but this discovery allows us to continue Evangeline's work. Sooner or later, there may be a time when humanity needs to get off this rock. Well, let's hope everything we did bought us a lot of time. Maybe not as much as we thought. What do you mean? About 75 Zephyr craft left Leviathan when Evangeline gave the order to evacuate. Only 52 ships made it to the rendezvous point at Nihau in Hawaii. What happened? Did the other ships malfunction or sink? Don't know. Maybe some of them didn't want to rendezvous. Maybe they don't want to be found. Or someone else found them first. It's a possibility we have to consider. Jesus, McAllen, is there anything I can do to help? Well, when does this boat start touching some open water, Tully? Hopefully the final round of diagnostics and sensors will be installed over the next two months. We still have some more structural tests to run when Oberlin gets back. Why? Because, Captain Jeffrey Tully, I just might need to hire a research boat. Paris, France. 2.30 a.m. A few months later. Come on, you promised you'd tell me. Take a left, you should see the lobby. I see it. Two guards at the front desk. Standard corporate security. I said there were conditions, and you haven't fulfilled your end of the bargain. You doubt my skills? I like empirical evidence. Lizette Manzibal pushed a cleaning cart filled with glass cleaner, surface soap, a mop, a broom, and a large trash receptacle in the middle. She wore the faded yellow smock that was the uniform of countless nocturnal custodians. I said I could get you to the fifth floor. I just want to know one thing. What? Do you love it? <laughs> Are you kidding? I love our van. It has everything. Built-in crime lab, armory, almost two petaflops of processing power, and tactical and surveillance gear. It's like the mystery machine in Scooby-Doo. It's a bakery truck. We spent a quarter million dollar on a bakery truck. Was a bakery truck. That's why I call it the Eclair. You can't call it that. We need a better name. That's what makes the van so perfect. It's too cheesy. And the big eclair on the roof hides all the sensors. I think you're too cheesy. I'm approaching the security station. Okay, I put your name in the custodial database. Just keep pushing that cleaning cart and show the guards the ID badge I made for you. And Lizette. What? Don't act too... Clerican, I'm not bitchy. But you'd better hope that your forgery skills are excellent. Lizette, the guards! Bonsoir. Je viens commencer mon service. Salut. Ça fait plaisir de voir une jolie fille à cette heure. <laughs> tu devrais sourire un peu. T'es trop belle pour faire la gueule. Viens, Alain. Laisse-toi tranquille. Je vais laisser juste faire son travail. Ah, oh, lâche-moi. T'es bien trop vieux pour moi. I'm through. What floor again? Five. It's where most of the building ops are located. Lizette entered the elevator in the marble foyer. She pressed the button for the fifth floor. Did I just hear the elevator door close? Perhaps. I think that indicates you're in. Perhaps. Then the conditions of our deal have been met. Come on, you have to tell me, Lizette. We're business partners. Where did you get the money for this van? The usual. Let me guess. You stole the money. Not exactly. Then what? I stole Harlequin's antique cufflinks. I knew they were worth a fortune. And then some? Wow. I thought the whole point of our business was to go legitimate. You said you didn't want to ask Harlequin for help. I didn't. That's why I stole his cufflinks. Besides, half the money came from your college fund. We are depositing that money right back into that fund as soon as we get paid, right? Uh, Lizette, I have to finish my degree. I feel like it's more of an American thing. I happen to be American. I think you just want to go to those stupid, what do you call them, sorority parties. Actually, one of my greatest regrets is the fact that I've never been to a sorority party. Well, they would think you're stupid because college and sororities are stupid. Uh, copy that. Go out of the elevator and go straight for 20 yards and then make a right. I'm showing some weak heat signatures. I can't get a great read at this distance. Maybe other custodians, but they're all moving away from you. Got it. I've made the right and I am continuing down the corridor. Just keep walking another 10 yards. The hallway splits. Which way? Left. 
Look for the second door on the left. It should have a pretty strong electronic lock on the door. I'm there. I see a numeric keypad and a thumbprint scanner. All right. Time to see what this new crypto sequence I uploaded into the Eclair can do. Lizette, hold your phone near the keypad. From inside the Eclair bakery van parked across the street, Chloracan established contact with Lizette's modified mobile phone. He linked her data feed to the CPU in the van and quickly ran several decrypting algorithms until finally... Nice job. Okay, you're inside the main service station for the security camera feed. From the schematics I downloaded... Stole. Downloaded. We'll need to get the Eclair transmitter mated to one of these servers. I'll be able to be your eyes and ears on the higher floors of the building. Whatever. I need to get out of these clothes. Lizette pulled out a grey nylon backpack. She ripped off her janitorial smock to reveal a black top and black leggings before she stuffed her costume back into the bag. Okay, you should see three server racks ahead. Building security is the bottom left. You need to reroute the feed to the wireless transmitter in your pack. That'll send the live camera feed of floors 11 through 16 to the eclair. You mean the van? Be honest, you're secretly craving a pastry right now, aren't you? Will you focus? I hear someone coming. I just got the feed. You're right, there's someone, not a guard, walking down the corridor. He's going to pass the server clause in about 10 seconds. Can you hide? Where? Anywhere. Lizette urgently scanned the room for a ledge, a corner, anywhere to hide her diminutive frame. At the last moment, she spied a shipping crate of cables and wires in a dark corner of the room. She leapt inside and quickly covered herself in cables and electronics. The man entered the room, took a brief look around at the service stations, turned off the lights and left. That was close. You should have warned me. Well, I couldn't warn you until I have the camera feed. Now, I can warn you. Then warn me. Is the coast clear? <laughs> oh, that was weird. What? My screen. It just flickered and froze, but, but I think it's working again. Maybe you shouldn't have bought a used transmitter. You said we were on a budget. Clarican, is the coast clear? Hold on... Yes, the coast is clear. Go out and make a right. At the end of the hallway, you'll see the elevator bank. I'll have one waiting to take you directly to the 15th floor. Go, now. Lizette hurried to leave the cramped service station and silently sprinted down the hall and leapt into the open elevator cab. After checking the video feed to see that the floor was mostly deserted, Chloracan sent the elevator to the 15th floor. This is the laboratory floor, right? That's right. Biotech has major R&D facilities in the Philippines and Helsinki, but it turns out their most valuable microchip research is being conducted in an office building in the middle of Paris. Am I supposed to steal the computer files or just the chip? Our orders are just the chip. They just hired us to make sure this facility is as secure as it can be. Hmm. Which way? Head down the hall until you see a statue of some sort of dragon, then make a right. I'm walking down the hall. Wow, it's weird to see all those clinical laboratories inside an office building. I expected to see file cabinets and conference rooms. And what are you seeing? Huge lab stations, microscopes, centrifuges, and loads of cages. Cages? What kind of cages? I'm not sure. They look Wait, like... Lizette, you need to look out. I'm seeing three guards around the corner from you. One is standing by the coffee machine, and the other two look like they're standing around a desk looking at a monitor further down the hall. Uh, I can take them out. Lisette, no. We're not supposed to use contact. You know the assignment. That's against the rules. Well, Viatech wants to know where their weaknesses are. Maybe you didn't hear me. I said there was three of them. Now there's two. Damn, you're good. But there's still two more. Is the room with the microchip in front of them? I'm afraid so. I can't see any other way into the room without passing those guards. You know, there weren't supposed to be. I'll be right back. No, Lizette, you can't. Lizette reached into her backpack to remove a telescopic baton. She crouched low and stealthily followed the shadow line behind the guards, when suddenly, Lizette sprinted and slid on her knees, loading all of her momentum into the first guard's knee, bringing him down to the ground. She launched a powerful strike to render the first guard unconscious. Lizette sprang to her feet, but not before the remaining guard caught the left side of her face with his fist. But Lizette had expected it and swiftly twisted his arm behind him bringing his face into high-speed contact with the surface of the desk. Fucking God caught me with the left hook. You okay? My lip is bleeding, but I'm fine. Those gods won't stay down for long. Where am I going? Just ahead. You should see an airtight door with both a numeric lock and fingerprint scan. Yeah, I see it. But how can we get in? I'm about to do to that lock what you just did to those two guards. Three guards. Three guards. You know, I've said it before. I know, I know, I'm good. 
really good. Well, I'm no slouch myself. I'm in. Perfect. Do you see the chip? Grab it, let's get in and out. Clerican, something is really strange here. What? This room, it's filled with more cages. Cages that are filled with rats. I thought we were supposed to be stealing some advanced microchip. That's what our contract said. Some new low-power interface chip that Biotech spent half a billion dollars to make. Supposedly, it could change the world. They said the chip location was XZ-296. Lizette sprinted over to the largest wall that was filled with cages that pulled out on drawers. Each drawer had a location number on the front, and Lizette urgently scanned the wall. Huh. I found it. XZ-296. Fantastic. Grab the chip. Uh... Corican? What? There's no chip. The drawer is empty? No, it's not empty. It's just there's a rat here. There's a white rat inside the drawer. You're kidding. D do you... Damn it, Clerican, what do we do? Just grab the rat and get out of there. I know that, but which way? Left. Get down to the elevators at the end of the hall as fast as you... Oh, shit. What's wrong? I, I can't get control of the elevators. The, the wireless link must have gone bad. Lizette, I've got teams of guards heading to your floor. I can't stop the elevators. You, you've got to get out of there. What about the stairs? Fuck. No good. I'm seeing Paris Metropolitan Police posted at all the exit ways. Lizette, we've been made. Someone must have double-crossed us. The police scanner is showing more police getting called to the scene. We have got to get out of here. I'm the one still trapped in the building, holding a fucking $500 million rat. Lizette, get to the roof. I know it sounds crazy. Just trust me. Run as fast as you can and get to the roof. What the hell am I supposed to do on the roof? Open an umbrella and fly away? Just trust me. Take those emergency stairs all the way to the roof. Hurry, Lizette. You can make it. And what are you going to do? Get into position. Clorcan leapt out of his computer station in the rear of the van and jumped into the driver's seat. There was little traffic on the Paris streets at this late hour, and Clorcan threw the van into a hard turn on Rue Segoufin and jumped the curb to park the van in the middle of an open grass field in a small park. Status? I'm almost on the roof! Clorican raced back into the rear of the Eclair and began frantically flipping toggle switches on the inside roof of the van. Outside, the large six-foot painted Eclair mounted on the roof shuddered and then spun to point directly at the Viatech headquarters over half a mile away. Grappling hook activated. What's that? Stand back from the edge. Where are you? Okay, let's see if this works. Target acquired and fire! A surge of fire erupted from the back of the Eclair as the speeding grappling hook raced across the Parisian night sky and landed squarely against the water tower of the office building. It worked! The grappling hook worked! You've got to be kidding me! I'm hundreds of feet in the air! What I'm not kidding about is the 10 guards that are now flooding the 15th and 16th floor looking for you. You have got to slide down. This is the only way out. Here, I'm sending up a descender. Any lava? Now, Lizette. Lizette wrapped her hands around the cable descender and held on for dear life. Her heart quickened as she picked up speed before the motors in the descender slowed her approach. She deftly leapt to the ground and jumped into the passenger seat of the van. Go, go, go! How much do you love the Eclair? Okay, you were right. That stupid hook was worth the money. No time to say I told you so. There's about four police cars heading right for us. Take Rue de Chanel. We can hang a right and lose them in the 17th arrondissement. What's our next move? Why did Viatech report us? Someone burnt us. They wanted to get us caught. Do we head back to the apartment? No, there'll be police there. We need to get out of the country. Should we call Harlequin to... No, we're not calling Harlequin for anything. But Lizette... I... Look out! Down. Damn it! I'm, I'm not used to these tiny European streets. Just keep going. Lizette... Just tell me, are all of our adventures together going to be this fun? Well, Corrigan, there's only one way to find out. You have been listening to The Leviathan Chronicles. The Leviathan Chronicles was written and created by Christoph Lepupka, produced by Robin Shaw, produced and musical composition by Luke Allen, directed by Nobi Nakanishi, for a full list of cast and crew, or to purchase the ad-free director's cut, go to leviathanchronicles.com. Thank you for supporting us, and thank you for listening. 
To discover more podcasts set in the Leviathan universe, go to leviathanaudioproductions.com or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Leviathan Audio Production.